Now you have to know that uh, I'm a ham, so I appreciate your staying behind. <laughs> Locked the doors. <laughs> Do not break the glass. At any rate, uh, I thank you for being here. And as a uh, patron of this event, I've hardly had to do anything but pray. <laughs> and the prayers have been answered. Because many of you today came to me and said how you finished your manuscript, or something here happened, and you did something with your writing, and so on and so forth. And as we are ending this important day for me, it seems to me that I want to say at once that the audience coming here now is beginning to be younger. And that is good. You are young when you come here because your mind ain't giving up. But if you are new to writing or if you are at a place where you think writing is where you want to be, the sooner you start, the better you'll get. I started when I was a teenager. I wrote my first story after rewriting it many times under the uh, beautiful tutelage and mentorship of Earl Burney and Jake Zilber from the UBC in the 1950s. And finally, that story, that single story, published in a high school journal, admired by high school teachers uh, in spite of the grammar, <laughs> after which Earl worked on it and said to me, did you want to be a writer? As I handed him the same manuscript, and he handed it back and said, well, punctuate. <laughs> and sent me out of the room. And I was horrified that, well, he didn't recognize the genius. <laughs> and there were red marks all over it, just as you would receive if somebody took you seriously. And if you wrote professionally, you will know your editor is your first great enemy, who will now, through your failure in being perfect, will teach you what you need to know. Editors are the best teachers. And so I did learn, and the story was eventually published in uh, Prison Magazine. And then to their surprise, and certainly I didn't know what was going on, because I came from Chinatown into UBC, it was selected for Best American Short Stories in 1962, 1862. <laughs> but what I wanted to say was, uh, I didn't write then for the longest time until I finally thought I needed a computer or a $10,000 prize or whatever. And I had very high motives. I wanted to win. And of course, I didn't win. I got honorary mention. Uh, but lucky things happen. And as you know, I wrote the Jade Peony in a short story class taught by somebody who was barely known then and who I was disappointed with because if I had waited, Oh, maybe till the next semester to take my sabbatical from Toronto, where I live, and teach at Humber College. Uh, if I had waited, I could have gone back to UBC on my sabbatical and taken the three creative writing courses. I was asked, would you take these courses? Because we may be teaching uh, creative writing at Humber College. And you read, read, wrote something, and it was you know successful. And I thought. It was necessary because my mother had died, and it was time for me to be with my father as well. All of it came together. But I was disappointed with the teacher I had in the short story course. I took uh, poetry, uh, the poetry course, and uh, Louis Dudek was the teacher. And he took me aside at the end of the term, and he said, Wason, I." Um, will give you a passing grade if you promise never to write another line of poetry. <laughs> I said, sure. <laughs> and we were both relieved. <laughs> Drama taught me wonderfully how to make my dialogue count, because other areas of writing, other genres, have their lessons. But in the short story writing, I was uh, okay with it, and I certainly was taught very well. There was no question about it. But I was saying I'm okay with it because shortly after I learned that if I had waited till the next semester to take my um, 
my sabbatical, the uh, teacher for the short story course, famous even then in the 1950s and 60s, uh, was going to be Alice Munro. You see, you did what I did. <laughs> and I'm so glad. And for drama, I was going to have, in the last year of his life, it turned out to be, uh, Tennessee Williams. You see, who can blame me? Who can blame me? But I was born lucky, as my grandfather said, when he named me Wei Sun, which means to reform, to change for the better. And I am lucky. And luck works in strange ways. I wrote the short story, The Jade Peony, in that class, in that writing class, by that person who had written three books and got good reviews and a collection of short stories. And then finally, when the story was anthologized many times, I was asked if I would write a book. And I was then 53 years old. And uh, they were anthologizing the short story, the jp &E, and would I write a book? Well, I did, and the book was published. And I thought, good, because I am tired of people saying, you know, those who teach can't do. Right? Piss me right off. <laughs> OK? Uh, so I want to make that clear. <laughs> because now I could have a poster behind my desk that said, The JP and E by Wayson Choi. And I could say to my students, who were the uh, group we called uh, the underprepared students, <laughs> that's what we call them, when they uh, co go through grade 12 and cannot read or write appropriately. But you have to teach them. And teaching is my first love. At any rate, I would point to one student, I only did it to one, who didn't want to learn about subject-verb agreement and punctuation. And I said, you know, I wrote a book once. <laughs> Proudly pointed to it. And he looked at it and he said, so? <laughs> Shortly after I failed him, <laughs> he went on to better things, actually. Better to be a carpenter that makes more money than a writer, I always say. At any rate, we became friends, of course. But the point is, uh, I learned some hard lessons. And while I was here today, I remembered that I finally got a phone call when the Jade Peony was published. In fact, it was just about two weeks after. And this teacher from that class in 19... Uh, 77 phoned me and she said, Wayson, the Jade Peony, I saw the review in the Globe. It's wonderful. Isn't that the short story you wrote? Did you write a novel? I said, yes, I did. And then I said, and how are you doing, Carol Shields? <laughs> and she had, uh, you know, won the Pulitzer Prize, so I thought, it's best to hang up. <laughs> she doesn't need encouragement. <laughs> she was underprepared then. But that was my luck. And it's my luck to stand before you and to throw out a challenge so that when we meet again next year, God willing, uh, I will hear from some of you that you did something real with what you have lying around the house called the manuscript. About five of you came up to me and said, you finished your book or your manuscript, your first or your third one, it's sitting there, you sent it out, you can't get an agent, you did this, you did that. Well, wake up. It's so hard for them to get anything from the slush pile or a phone call from an unknown because the world is in chaos. You must bring clarity to your own work. You must believe in your own work. You must be willing now to say, okay, I'm going to bite the bullet. I tell my students through this, they said, how were you discovered? I said, I was scouted. I was lucky. That's what happened. Somebody read the JP and they said, gee, I wonder if he would write a book. And they read it because it was published and anthologized, and there was somebody reading it and turned to the publisher and said, this guy really is interesting. Well, if you have your manuscript lying in the drawer or haunting you or lying in an office where they don't have time for you or they send it back without comment, you have to do something about that, which is to roll up your sleeve and do the following. Please, if you don't know what to do with it, there's a publication called Writer's Market. 
2012, and it's published by Writer's Digest. There's a one called Canadian Markets. You can go to the library and get it because they're 40 and $50. If you're in a writer's group, the group of you can put in $10 each if there's a half a dozen of you and get a copy and then challenge each other and say, look, you've written a book, as somebody told me uh, yesterday, I've written this book, what is it about? The theme has to do with medicine, etc." And two of you actually came up with that idea that this is a medical story. TV inter interests us and influences us. I said, well, what happened? I sent it out, came back, sent it out, came back. I said, don't send it out anymore. Get a reputation. Go and look at Writer's Digest or Canadian Markets, and it's in the library. And what you do is you look up the index, medicine, all the publications that will accept work about medicine, all the publications that will, that will accept human interest stories. They're all there. There's dozens of them. 30, 40 of them. Small, big, large, they explain, here's what we accept, here's how we want to see your manuscript, here's how long it should be. And of course, they always say, we only pay so much or we'll give you a subscription. So what? Get published. Make yourself proud that you had the courage to write and now you have the courage to stand up. Do your best. Follow the format, which is the instructions given at the beginning of those digest books, and uh, send it out. Send out, as what professional writers do who freelance, send out five or six different manuscripts at a time, one at a time to one potential publisher, and wait for the children to come home or wait for the check. What you do is you're learning what it takes to see if you can break into the market, because it's otherwise very impossible for most of us, unless you're lucky. So what I'm saying is, why can't you be scouted? Why can't you get published somewhere and anthologized? And maybe, who knows, as happened to, uh, you know, Susanna, one of the books gets into Reader's Digest or one of the articles. Uh, your local newspapers will publish something of yours. Uh, but go further. Make sure you get the right audience for a story that has a medical theme. Uh, lots of romance magazines are publishing in places that you never heard of, but there they are and people read them. And that's how you build up a following. That's how you say to yourself, somebody actually wants to read me. You have to find the right reader. Think of J.K. Rowling's, 28 publishers rejected her. All right, and you should know that 27 of those editors and publishers have since committed suicide. <laughs> okay? So, what you should know is there is justice. <laughs> okay? And I think what you should know too is it doesn't matter how old you are, it doesn't matter whether you're older than my 73 years or younger by 50 years, it means that you're a writer, and you will stand up for your work. And if that big thing that you finish, all the tears and all the truth you put into it, as I said to you last year, this is what you need to do. Write a story that risks something that you want to read, and then see that the writing rises in craft to make other people want to read it. But they can't want to read it if you don't meet your audience. All right, do a blog. And you saw the digital responses. You could also get published in uh, different uh, e-books and e-magazines. They are all there. There is no reason for not saying to yourself, I deserve attention and I'm willing to get it. And you will be rejected. And what makes you so special? Well, what makes you so special is Sometimes you get information about why they didn't take it, but why they like it. Sometimes you will get information from the people you send it to. We would take it if you would kindly note our suggestions for changes. Or we can only publish 20 pages at the most, and you've sent us 42, but we like it. Can you give us 20 pages? Well, you do it, because writing also has to do with the marketplace. 
And in the marketplace are readers, the right reader, waiting to read you. That's what you want to find. Some of the best books have been rejected until they almost gave up, and then finally they were published posthumously because they couldn't find the right reader or they gave up too soon. But each time it comes back, they're willing to rework it. They're willing to say, yep, it's sweat and blood, and uh, here's some sweat, I'll hang on to the blood for, for now. But what you need to know is, unless you feel you deserve attention, you won't get it. And unless you find 10 different ways to get that attention, even if you're shy, something in an envelope, send to, sent to the right place with the right covering letter. That's what you need to do. I would love to hear from you next year when we are here uh, together, and if you should return, that you did that. How long is it going to be before you finally do what you need to do? You're not a teacher, you're a doer. But as you know, the best teachers are indivisible from the student, from the doer, from those who might have something to say to you. Well, I want to end this session with the challenge. Don't come here and not do something different. And don't come here and do all that writing and feel you have no place to put it. Look for a place. Just think of apartment hunting. The right place, the right landlord, the right room, a room of one's own, a publication that says, we do want to read you. And then you get the right kinds of readers. The readers are already openly sympathetic to those themes represented by the magazine's image and the magazine's uh, you know, direction. Do it. Do it all. You know, if you want to dance in public and you have to go in strip tease, what the hell? <laughs> You know, can you imagine another chapter in your book? <laughs> and then one day you'll say, well, you know, I was rejected 28 times, but 27 of them have died. <laughs> but you will live, and I look forward to all of you being back here. And I certainly want to thank the founders of this event, five years in the running, with majorly the same volunteers who have not felt that they were doing thing, anything less than what is important. Bravo to the team and bravo to you to choose us because we're you. Thank you so much. Thank you.